Hey everyone, thanks for joining us with the Soul Traders. That's Amy, I'm Bo. <laughs> um, today is our second of three webinars commissioned by the City of Melbourne Arts Team. So thank you, City of Melbourne Arts Team. And Yvonne is just in the background. Um, she's a voice, she's a headless voice that we can pop up at any time. Um, we've posted our social media handles in the chat window. So please do the same and also say where you're um, tuning in from. Um, and oh yeah, can everyone also just, if you're going to share this, um, you know, if you want to do a screen grab or take a photo or whatever, then um, share it on yeah. social media and tag, there's a hashtag called Creative Melville. Um, and also the other hashtag is Soul Traders Podcast. Um, today's topic is marketing and community building. <laughs> I just took a photo. Hi. <laughs> That was, yeah, that was not very paparazzi. Um, okay, marketing and community building for creatives. Powerful um, topic. Very excited about this one. Yeah, so do you want to just make a little start, Amy? What do you reckon? Like, let's just go straight in. What's, let's what's jump right in. the um, biggest hurdle and what do you think is, the, you know, the big deal for creatives and marketing as opposed to everyone else in marketing? So um, in case you don't know, anyone doesn't know, Bo and I have run workshops together um, with artists and creative businesses, um, specifically about navigating social media. Um, and we always come up against the same kind of sentiment, I, I feel, um, which is, I call it the marketing ick factor. Um, and basically, it's particularly with artists and creative people, um, there's a real discomfort about promoting your own work, about talking about what you do, um, about anything that's seen as, um, as a marketing effort. Um, I think in general, artists are just not great, like terrible at um, self-promotion. Okay, and I'm just gonna just butt in, which I know I'm not allowed to butt in, but I'm just gonna butt in. <laughs> Go on. Artists, on behalf of artists, the reason, one of the reasons that they have this sort of propensity away from marketing has been that in the past, the way the industry's worked is that they've had a gallerist to do that for them. So there's been this kind of, the artists have been in one creation, yeah, in the making process. And then there's been this kind of middleman. And then there's been this other shift into this idea that we're somehow if you're an artist who's marketing yourself really well, that you then would not have that same level of elite or in like integrity in your art. So they sort of somehow un so wrongly you, became mutually exclusive to be good at marketing. That that, art. that that division that existed um, between the marketing side of things and the, that was traditionally done by the gallerist and the artist has meant that it's created this culture and it's misconception. Yeah. yeah. And that's why I also think that there isn't, you know, um, I often think about the way that um, musicians who are also a creative art market themselves and understand that marketing is part of their yeah. the way that they have to reach people. But visual artists haven't had the same, they just haven't had the same type of background. So I think there's an invisible hurdle for people. Um, and it, it isn't sort of inbuilt into the culture as much, I think. So I think that's probably why um, why there is that sort of weird kind of mismatch sometimes with people yeah. working, I mean, particularly as visual artists, but others as, but as well. You know what, though? I actually think that that has extended beyond artists. And it's really interesting that you can, can point to something um, sort of structural that, that probably created or contributed to that but I think there's a general culture that if you take yourself seriously as a creative person that you shouldn't be talking about um, what you're doing and you sh sort of shouldn't have to engage in any kind of marketing activity um, oh yeah like your work should speak for itself and that's exactly. it okay yeah. Yeah. which unfortunately I just it doesn't there's a real mismatch between that sentiment and the world that we live in right now where you know, there's so much content out there um, and, you know, it's, it's, you owe it to your work to, to share it with people, I think. Um, 
Yeah, so I guess um, what, what do we do about that, at that hurdle that creative people have? Um, and I think the, one of the first things is to acknowledge that that culture exists and kind of examine that for yourself and your feelings around that and your discomfort if it's there. Um, but the second thing is to kind of rebrand um, marketing as community building, um, which um, when you're speaking about social media and content marketing and online marketing, honestly, there's, that's quite accurate, I think. What do you think? Yeah, I reckon that makes a lot of sense. So when we've done our workshops before, we've had visual artists come and they do find, <clears throat> sometimes there's a sense that with social media and marketing that they're, it's almost like a kind of platform, like a soapbox and you're sort of yelling from the soapbox. But actually that's a really sort of, you know, it's not a great way to use social media and it's not social. And yeah. the way that people generally relate to one another is that they have a community of people. So for me, that includes clients, colleagues, includes friends. Um, you know, they're all part of my community and also other photographers. You know, we all follow one another. Um, I, don't, um, I don't think using social media as that, you know, artists sometimes feel that they're, yeah, just sort of yelling, shouting something from the rooftop, but actually the idea of building a community and sort of going, well, say you were having an exhibition, for example, um, who would you invite, like on your email list? And it wouldn't just be mm. other artists. Um, it would also be curators. It would also be your friends and family would also come along. Um, and anyone else who championed or supported you or had any other type of interact, you know, all of those people would come along. And so I like to sort of offer that that's the space that it, it more, it's more of a space where you're being inclusive of all the people that you would usually be inclusive of in real life. Um, yeah. rather I think um, making that real life comparison is really helpful um, to get over this, this hurdle, this discomfort. Um, you know, in real life, humans, they want to connect, they want to belong. Um, so if you think about like um, a sort of old school IRL um, community, like say, you know, that you might find um, at a weekend market or at, um, you know, churches or um, at a cafe or a, at the local pub where people collect um, and speak, you know, speak to each other and connect and, you know, um, and talk about what they're doing. I think sometimes it really helps to think about that that real setting and because I, I, there are a lot of commonalities there and I think when you forget that people just want to connect in a real way um, and that people want to come have conversations and they want to be heard and they want to belong, um, I think if you forget that, then um, you can start to go off track with your social media in particular. Yeah, so there's a little bit about that we've talked about this idea of being real and being, you know, in the way that you would in a in real life setting, trying to translate that in a in a sense into the digital realm. And also you talk a lot about the idea of generosity inside that and, and the way that you know that's how a community functions in real life and that's how a community is built and that's all trust that's all sort of trust based and relationships based and and stuff but it's like also, that. Um, it's it's sort of not self-serving it's not like you've set up a community as a kind of mirror for yourself or as this kind of group of fans it's kind of you set it up because you want to connect with people and you want people to connect with your work um, yeah. and you want to start conversations about um, topics issues um, uh, processes pursuits um, you know, commonalities that you have with people in your community. Like you want real connection. That's that's kind of the that's what you're searching for, and that's why you keep showing up. Not not to sort of like get up on your soapbox um, and you know ch just champion what you're doing. Yeah, that's sort of not its purpose. And I think if you see it through that lens of kind of trying to serve your community and be generous with them, and when I talk about generosity, I could go on and on. But basically the whole idea is flipping this around um, and thinking not about like what you want to say about yourself, but what about what people want to hear from you? Like what would, what do you have to offer or to say um, that's valuable to other people in your community? 
um, and how can you reach them and how can you have those conversations that, that you think um, people want to have with you? Yeah, we talked about that a bit last week, actually, this idea of what do people always ask you about? Like, what are you an expert yeah. in? And what, what's the conversation that you could speak about, you know, until the cows come home? And they're the sorts of things that become yeah, like, yeah, almost pillars or sort of tenets of your of your social media presence, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's something important to mention here that's like it is a marketing term. But I think um, it's a really good one to keep front and centre in your mind um, when you're thinking about building community and, and what's essentially um, building relationships and, and making connections um, on these online forums. Um, so the idea is called Like No Trust and it's basically like a spectrum um, of, of a relationship um, between you and your community um, between sort of like all the way from, you know, they don't know who you are, they don't know you like from anyone, um, uh, to starting a conversation, to getting to know you and your work and what's important to you and what drives you, to then um, getting to the point of trusting you enough to maybe wanting to um, purchase something from you, work with you, um, yeah, like invest their money basically um, in something that you've created. Um, so it's an, the like, no trust factor is incredibly important um, because basically people, we know um, broadly that people make purchasing decisions uh, from an emotional kind of um, part of their brain, not, not a logical part. So if they like, know and trust you, they're much more likely to want to work with you or um, to want to buy something from you. What do you think, Bo? Um... I love that actually, the like, no trust. Um, because it also, in, again, it is ref, it's, it's a reflection of, of all that in real. So if I were to go to an event, there would be lots of people who I like, and then there's, all, there's like a sort of another band of people who I know, and then there's like another band of people who I'd trust. Like the inner circle versus yeah. acquaintances yeah. and kind of best buddies and, yeah. In a sense, like no matter, you know, because people think in marketing, they're like, oh, yeah, it's all about, you know, having a zillion followers or something like that. But actually, that's not where my, and none of my work comes from, um, from that space. Um, all of my work comes from word of mouth recommendations. Yeah. So, I mean, the job is pretty much in the bag at that point. So if someone who you really trust um, their opinion, they say, this is the person who you need to be working with on this project. You know, at that point, my it's Instagram, value, which, yeah. like, everything is just a sort of, is just, um, you know, bolstering the fact that that recommendation, that personal recommendation was there. And that that's something to get to the point where somebody is they're advocating for you. Yeah. They're advocating for you. That, that's sort of moving, I guess what, you know, used to be called like that marketing funnel where it's like, you know, you've got that sort of funnel shape, you've got people, all these people on the outside who, and they might be people who maybe follow you on Instagram or like a post or whatever. And then they kind of move down the funnel to become um, at, you know, the very, whatever that other point. The tightest the point is like, they're your best friends they're in the inner circle. They would be like, not only would they be someone who you work with and enjoy working with, they would be someone who would then also recommend you to their peers. And so, you know, having all of that, that's what we have in our normal life as people, but that's what we sort of also have in social media and, and at, in that community of people, because not everyone also is going to employ you today some of those things are slow burn you know people are waiting or, you know you're just sort of in the wings looking for projects and you know people are just sort of going to slot you in and it might be in five years from now uh, which is totally fine yeah um, I think yeah. in particular in creative industries um if you're service-based say like you know you're an artist that might want that might be creating a work um, or a body of work that might take you a few months or that might take you years, you know, people may wait years um, and always have in the back of their mind, oh, you know, when this body of work is complete, I know who I want to contact um, to photograph and document that work. And like they've got Bo Wong on the mind and you just keep reminding them and keep kind of strengthening that relationship over time with your content. Yeah. Uh, and um, 
you know, or if, if you're making products, um, particularly if you're hand making them, which I know a lot of people in this cohort probably do, um, there's a, that's a lot of time that's a very valuable, very personal kind of relationship if somebody's buying that product that you have handmade. Um, and a lot of the time that's quite an investment for somebody. So they might, you know, it might be a very slow burn marketing effort um, from the time that they're admiring for, for months or years your work and understanding the story behind those products to finally being like, I've saved my money and I know exactly like, like the, um, you know, ceramic vase I want to purchase. And it's got to be from this person because, you know, by that time, they're just so, um, they really trust what you're doing and they trust that that's like a really good quality um, item and they want to have that relationship with you. They want to take that okay. to the next. They're also deep in your story, aren't they, at that yeah. point? Right. That's I mean, handmade products is so important for the story, isn't it? Also to Frida, who's um, popping in some questions, we'll definitely, we've, um, we'll definitely talk about that toward the end because we've absolutely chat because it's definitely, I think you wouldn't be the only person. Yeah, do, um, if anyone has a question, do just pop it in the chat and we will um, address those in a few minutes. Um, so Bo and I actually, we did some work together. Um, I do um, sort of one-on-one -on -one coaching with, um, particularly I love working with creatives and artists um you know in terms of around kind of talking about their work um and sharing it on social media platforms um and one of the things that i um love to talk about um is the venn diagram of content I marketing venn diagrams Bo, i created this actually for you Bo. i'm pretty sure um because I know you're a visual person and i know how much you love diagrams anyway i have prepared a visual aid everyone can you see that? Look, you stuck it up on the kitchen pantry. My kitchen. I love this. <laughs> okay, so. Um, oh my God, it's so I good. It's in Europe, but I'm hoping that everyone else can see it yeah. for real. Um, so this is the diagram. These are the sort of three areas and where you want to get is like the sweet spot. And this is the con where the content magic happens, where the like, no trust factor is. Oh my so God. Voice and values. Tone and style, which is like how your how your sort of um, content looks and feels, like what your brand and what your business and your art and how you portray it, what it feels like, your story and vision, what drives you creatively, um, your unique voice when you when you speak, people know it's you, and what values underpin what you're doing creatively. Um, that Venn diagram, a you know I do love Venn diagrams, but also it actually took us a little while. When I, when I was doing my work with you to distill down what those things were and they have a very, you know, that, that's the sort of tenet that moves through all of my stuff. In fact, I've actually, I've actually got my Venn diagram here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to put some questions in the chat. Um, oh, yeah, that's a good idea so that people can work out a little bit about how to identify those sorts of things like um i identified my voice and values as being integrity was really important to my business honesty and reliability so we talked about that a fair bit sharing success so that my success is a collaborative experience with my clients and also advocating for better industry practice and that's sort of something that i'm constantly you know that i feel passionate about and talk about um, and then we had the tone and style, which we talked about had a boldness, but it still had kindness and care and sense of humour. And then my story and vision, which we talked about my journey and what drives me, was yeah. my passion for art, architecture and design, and that I also advocate for artists. Um, and so you I, come from your own background of, of having studied... That's you know, right. And and art, and art. Art. bridge those two... Yeah. And also to do with creative collaboration. So that stuff, can I just like, honestly, this is like a Venn diagram. That's what mine looks like. Yay. Um, so yeah, that stuff I think is really important for, um, you know, just this general sense. Like when you, it's almost like something that you can hold up, you know, you sort of shine a light through that for the way that you are posting and working with social media. And you can kind of, hold it up against that light 
you know, in, or that window and say, you know, does that sort of fit inside these, these values and does it fit with this tone and style and, you know, how that sort of... It's sort of like yeah. a substrate, isn't it? It's kind of like a structure, like imagine like the skeleton of a building that kind of holds everything together. Like it's, you don't necessarily, you know, you don't say, Bo, like I'm honest and I'm, I've got integrity, but like that underpins everything all the conversations you have, all the issues that you, you know, want to discuss with your community are underpinned by those values and yeah. where you come from in your own, like, journey towards, yeah. like, the business that you have now. Yeah. And part of that was also, you know, making some decisions, which I think, I think this will also apply to everyone. And I realised it was a real hurdle for me. And that was about what's in and what's out for social media and what's, you know, how which parts of my life, you know, do I need to show all parts of my life or do I need to, you know, think about which sort of tenets I'm going to share and which things, you know, maybe they have a place on stories but maybe not on the grid. And Can you give, you give know, us an example that. Of, of that, like some um, of the choices that you've made? Well, I, all of my examples have now been blown out of the water since I've been stuck at home because originally I didn't really have, like, photos of my kids or my dog or my home. Um, usually they would maybe sometimes be in stories, but um, nowadays we're just home. So, you know, that's the other thing. You make a rule, then you break the rule and that's fine. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah it's almost... a trial and error thing as well. Like, yeah. you know, these things are never fixed. It's always a kind of feedback cycle of sort of having that ongoing conversation and trying things out and being prepared to just, you know, but the other thing, Bo, is that your home is full of art and it's full, it's not yeah, just family yeah. space. Like, you know, you took a picture of your, you shared a picture on your Instagram of your dining room table, which is just, you know, it's just like a mini gallery for all these artists and designers. Yeah, so, that's true. And that's a beautiful overlap between kind of the work that you want to do and the artists that you want to support, um, you know, and the things that are personal to you, like your home. Yeah, and that's part of the idea, I guess, you know, and not necessarily intentionally, but it does fit this idea of honesty and integrity. I'm, you know, it's it's not like my whole life is based it. around my work and the passion that I have for advocating for artists and for working with artists and doing those things. It's not like a a day job. It's a whole way of life. And I think mo for most people, they're you know, the creative life and their action, you know, it's all kind of enmeshed completely together because it's ultimately when you dig down, it's a values-based, um, you know, sort of system. So if your values are that you want to support artists and you want to, um, you know, make space for creativity in your life and you value that in our culture and in our society, then you're going to do things that are going to support that and you can talk about things that support that. Um, we've got loads of questions coming yeah. through. I'm loving it because I'm really excited about them. So um, a quick one on, you know, where your community are, where they're hanging out. So we we were talking about Instagram we also have started a Facebook group, but generally, I guess the other thing is in um, in the same way that your community would, you know, the people that you hang out with are going to hang out at a particular cafe and not another. It's a little bit like that as well with social media about where mm -hmm. where your community are hanging where out. Where are so, you people? Yeah, I mean, are they on Twitter? Mine, I mean, I personally know, but other people perhaps. Um, so that's also, you know, and this idea of, um, I think if we do, you know, it's probably a good opportunity at any point to sort of talk about numbers um, and the sort of, you know, our audience, because it is, although, you know, we're talking about it more from a community sort of space where we're part of that ecosystem, um, there's still the idea, there is a, you know, that audience um, sort of sense. So I wanted to just quickly dig into the idea of the minimum viable audience that we oh, talked yes. about. Oh, yes, I love this one. I'll share this link. Um, but it's an idea that, um, that we came across um, from um, Seth Godin, who's a wonderfully um, kind of, is a wonderful voice in the marketing sphere of someone who I actually respect, who's very intelligent and, um, you know, uh, and very generous with his blog and what he shares. Um, so he has this idea, I said share this link, 
Um, it's called um, the minimum viable audience. So basically, he argues that um, um, he says that um, when you seek to engage with everyone, you rarely delight anyone. So the idea is that you know if you if you say uh, who's my who's likely to buy my products, who who am I speaking to, who's in my community, who's my audience? Oh, I want to reach everyone. Uh, you know, everyone could potentially be my customer or like want to have a relationship or a conversation with me. Um, and what that what happens when you decide that everybody is your audience, like you. Um, the conversations that you have become really generic and really like bland because basically, um, I mean, you think about real life communities, um, those are formed around common interests, right? So, you know, basically um, the Seth Godin's idea is that you should think about like, if you could, like, if your business could function um, with this really small amount of like devoted people, like, how small can you make that group and like who would they be and what interests do they share and like who are those people um rather than thinking everybody you think like how can i delight these people how can i you know provide like value um you know brighten their day with my content so this leads into i can see the questions um yeah, yeah, why don't we read some? I'm just going to answer Iris's one and then I think maybe you should answer Frida's one just before it. Yeah. Iris says, I like your focus on community building for your marketing efforts, but how does that target the people who have the money to buy your art? No like and trust is a vital trajectory, but how do you get in front of your target audience? So this is an, a really good one because I talk to a lot of artists who are being followed by lots of other artists and none of those people, all of those people are being inspired by you. They're not actually purchasing your work. So yeah. sometimes um, that can be, sometimes um, artists take it, a kind of a trajectory in their the way that they've sort of marketed themselves where they've really only sort of shared with other artists and they become that's not um to devalue that at all because they are still your community um getting your work in front of people is a little bit different about than um the idea of bringing people in I guess the reality is that as especially if you're a visual artist working with you know say you're making paintings and they're you know five thousand dollars each they're not something that people are going to just quickly buy online like a mug or something like that um, that's thirty dollars so um, some of that stuff is to do with building you know building your um, building a trust relationship so that's about being a professional career artist and showing that that is the kind of work that you're creating. So for that scenario, I would be saying, if you really want to get your stuff in front of people that you, that want to buy your art, um, they actually are extremely closely aligned with those other artists who are following you. So if you're, they are friends of those people, all of those, you know, it's not that, you know, every person is a bit of a kind of, has their own spider web out. So I wouldn't worry too much about, you know, who's got the money and who doesn't have the money. I think at the end of the day, building a relationship, building a, a space where you are um, considered knowledgeable and your work is considered valuable. I think those sorts of things are the biggest focus more so than looking for people with money on social media. I think that's, yeah. that can be sort of, it, it's just not a great, it's I, so um, yeah, I think that you could make yourself crazy like that. It's kind of like watching your follower count and just thinking about growing that number rather than... And that's where I think we can also lead into um, free yeah. description. Because I, I just often... have one thing to say um, to Iris, um, which is um, when you talk about values, I think it's really important to think about your values, but also about the values of like, yeah, your target audience, I guess your customers. So I'm sure you've sold work before. Who are those people? Um, can you ask them why Why were they drawn to your work? What did they find interesting about it? Um, a lot of the time in marketing, we talk about problems because basically when people are making decisions about spending money, usually they're doing it from an emotional level and they're thinking about um, what can this do for me and what how can this make my life better? So when it comes to art, um, it might be just, this will look good in my living room. This is the right size, this is the right colors, or you know, I'm connecting with something um, in the story 
behind this art or in the, the intention behind it or in the process, you know, it might not just be like, I like how that looks, but you've got to kind of get inside the head of like what people are seeing um, of valuable and that of value and um, that's valuable in your work. And so it's I think exactly it's the same as a as an exhibition opening, for example. Everyone who comes to your exhibition opening is not there to buy your work. Some people are there for the snacks, and for the yeah. story, and some people are there to be seen, and some people are there because they you know they're actually interested in your work, and some people are there because you know and you know lots of artists also get to the point where all of their friends and family have already purchased their artwork. And so all those people will come, but they're not gonna purchase anymore. So, you know, uh, your social media community is almost identical to the people who are coming to your exhibition opening. But they, they can, people can move from the people who turn up for the free booze to the people purchasing art. Like me and this painting by Geordie Hewitt behind me. Um, you know, I went, I dragged my husband along and I said, oh, you know, I just really like this artist. I really want to see this show um, just because I, I like her work and, you know, we can see some people we know. Um, and, I, you know, I want to go for the event, for the spectacle. And I wasn't intending to buy anything because it, it never crossed my mind because I'm still in that student mindset of being really broke. But my husband was like, this work is great. It would look great in our living room. I really dig this artist and everything you've told me about her. I want to buy something. Let's buy that piece. And we did. So it can happen that way. Um, so could you say something about how to network on social media? Do you, okay. um, do you think right. likes, yeah. followers or views are more important on Instagram? Um, okay, so the most important thing on Instagram is engagement. Um, so uh, the engagement kind of um, factor, like the numbers, I guess, come from likes and views but the most important thing is comments shares and saves so basically when you're thinking about putting content out there um, ideally you should be focused on getting people to comment so what can you say what can you show that will that will kind of tip people over the line from being kind of passive um, sort of viewers of of your content to kind of wanting to, like needing to um, communicate you, with you on, and connect with you on a sort of deeper level. So when I'm um, uh, talking to people about their content and what they're sharing, you know, I just, I think you always have to be going for that real connection and, um, and engagement in, in the most real way that you possibly can. Um, and in terms of networking, look, honestly, even in a really old school kind of way, Instagram is a great place to connect with people who you think are really interesting, um, whose work you admire, who you want to have a conversation with, like other artists, other people in your field, find them and comment, be social and comment on their work and, you know, and be generous in terms of um, providing feedback for them. And you might actually start a real relationship or a friendship that way. It's you know, and that, that yeah, that leads that back in, oh, sorry. in terms of the algorithm loves that kind of stuff too. Go on, Bo. I was going to say that leads into the idea of the minimum viable audience. So it's not about trying to sort of gain lots and lots and lots of followers. It's about having, it's about building trust with the people who you're already engaged with. Um, and that, you know, I think a lot of people who work in marketing and work in social media, it's like, how can I beat this algorithm? How can I trick the algorithm? How can I, you know, how can I get lots of, you know, people buying likes and buying followers and yeah. all of this sort of stuff. And that's absolutely in a sort of space that, um, you know, it doesn't fit with, I don't, I think Amy or my, in any part of our values to do something like that. And it also doesn't really pay off. I it think doesn't it doesn't have any doesn't value either. Yeah. Um, it's not the right headspace to be in, um, uh, and one of the one of, one of the most compelling reasons is that it doesn't work. It used to um, right at the beginning of Instagram. You there were ways to game the system, but now they basically aren't. The best way to spend your time isn't by you know trying to game the system or you know do these funny workarounds or apps that show you who's. Um, you know, who are your ghost followers or anything like that. Spend that time and energy 
making great content and trying to connect to people in a real way. It's as simple as that. Um, and this, well, Bridget's question here, on social media, I tend to just write statements, but I guess asking questions to your audience helps. Are questions a good idea? That's a good question. Um, um, yeah. yeah, I think they are. What do you think, Bo? Um, look, I think if you are actually interested in the answer, they're good. I don't think questions for the sake of writing a question, which I have seen people do, um, because again, with the algorithm thing, it's like people are looking to beat it and they think that putting a question in, I think if you're genuinely interested in the answer, um, then definitely ask a question. You're a big question asker, Amy. Oh, I love questions. Yeah. And I you legitimately am interested in the answer. I'm one yeah. of those people, you know, that I'll go to get a coffee and I'll come back an hour and a half later and my husband will be like, what the hell took you so long? And it will be because I've asked somebody in a real way with like, you know, this, this really intense gaze that apparently I have, you know, about their day. And I've got a real answer about like, oh, you know, like things aren't so good and like nobody's coming to their like gig or whatever. And we've had this big exposition about like, about breaking down like their work and what they do and like, you know, who, who wants to come to gigs on a Monday night anyway? And, you know, like, so yeah, ask questions. But um, I think the better way to approach it would be not just questions for questions sake, but what's the best way to start a conversation? Um, or what's the best way, um, you know, it's, it's like if you're having a conversation in the pub, there are kind of conversation starters and there are conversation stoppers. So if you're, you know, those annoying people who are just making statements about themselves all the time and they're just not fun people, you know, like you don't, you don't want to be stuck in the corner of a party with that person who's just like, don't you know I'm just so great? Haven't you heard how great I am? Haven't you seen my new shiny car? You know, you want to, that person who's like, you know, if you could have any car and money wasn't the object, what kind of car would you have? Like, you know what I mean? Like, that, that's a big difference between people making statements and just kind of, you know, being boring and people who are trying to connect. Um, we've got a question from Serena. Is there risk, is there a risk in marketing, um, in growing a business too quickly, then not being able to cater to your existing community as a result? I think that's a really interesting and good question. So I think what Serena's saying is that sometimes your business shifts and you start doing something new. How do you bring your community from before with you? Um, and, you know, how do you still cater to your existing community? Um, I think it's a really good question and I think it's it still harks back to the same idea. Um, this, sorry to bang on about the minimum viable audience, but in rather than growing, this idea of growing your numbers and your following, what more can you offer to the people who are already there? Because yeah. they're already in. And, you know, if you have a new offering, they're very likely to be extremely receptive to that offering and because can, they're already in your journey and on into your story. They're, they're already hooked. And ideally you just want to, you just want to bring everyone along for the ride. Um, and I think it comes back to that idea of, of the Venn diagram and, and really asking those questions about your core values. Do you know what I mean? So I know Serena's an architect, so she'll love this idea of like the bare bone structure, like, what are the foundations um, that your practice or your business is built on? Because they don't change and they support everything else. So you might change products or have new lines or offer new, like new incentives or try all kinds of new things or take photos in a different way. But at your core, um, what's important? Like, what are you standing on? What are the unshakable kind of foundations of, what you're doing is it what do you think Bo? I totally agree all again it comes back down to this idea of values because I think if people are aligned with your values they'll come with you um, on an absolute a very diverse plethora of projects that you'll have on offer um, because that core values there there's going to be people who you know are only there for one small thing and that's okay 
but the majority of people are in it for the long haul with you. And I think, you know, they're deep in your story and, and they're connected. And that is a really, that that's a sort of fabric in a community that's not so easily broken. So I actually think that, um, yeah, you might be surprised at how, how much and how easily people will want to be part of whatever new thing that you offer. Um, yeah. We've I'm run out of time. Do you have, did you want to, were you going to wrap up or? I was else? basically just going to agree with you. So. Oh. <laughs> well, obviously that's the only option at this stage. Um, I'll just check the, oh yeah. So everyone's just agreeing and that's all great. Um, so I think we've answered all the questions and I think we've, come back to a few of our, um, you know, our usual tenets, which is identifying your um, voice and values in your business and in the way that that will present in social media. Um, looking at your story and your vision and what, you know, looking at how you got to where you are and, you know, people will engage with that story and also thinking about how you represent your business and what your brand looks and feels like, which is your tone and style. So I think if anyone was going to do homework, they could definitely do um, Amy's homework, um, which were the questions in the chat. And um, also I've also added, oh. bro, um, we talk about a lot of these things in an episode we did pretty recently, um, it, about Instagram and originality. So we, oh, we yeah. riff on all, a lot of these things. I just put the link to that in the um, chat uh, because if you are interested in the topics we've talked about today, I think we, we talk about a lot of similar things and expand on those in that episode. But I was also going to say um, I um, did, did a series of Instagram tips on my Instagram page. They're here on my um, story highlights. Insta tips, um, recommend. <laughs> Highly recommend. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you so much. Oh, yes, Pippa. And of course, your visual identity is, um, you know, part of your tone and style. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Come next time. Tune yes, in. See you guys next week. And, um, and yeah, don't forget to share. Oh, before you go, I'm going to take a photo too. And um, I'll see you all hopefully next week. And I hope that this was really helpful to you and, um, and see you either on Facebook and or Instagram. Thanks for joining us. See you later. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>